Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this latest webinar for International Complex. My name is Matthew Jane. I'm director of Unique Venues of Manchester. Um, we are a marketing and consultancy organization um, that uh, has recently delivered a hybrid conference uh, before uh, lockdown 2.0. Um, I'm joined today uh, by my colleagues that uh, were involved with that, and hopefully we're going to give you um, some insight into uh, how we delivered our hybrid event and also some of the lessons we learnt uh, that you may be able to uh, find useful and, and take on board. Um, to start off, to give you a little bit of con uh, context, uh, Unique Venues of Manchester, as I said, is a uh, marketing consulting organisation uh, focused on promoting venues uh, to conference and event buyers. Uh, we have uh, a website, uniquevenuesofmanchester.co.uk, um, where we actively promote those uh, venues, hotels, bars, restaurants and event suppliers. Um, Historically, as part of our uh, offer to our venues, our members, uh, we've put together a live uh, UVM Expo uh, consisting of a uh, kind of a, around about 40 exhibitors uh, with attendees attending. Obviously, COVID has come along and uh, now we needed to change uh, what we were doing as the venue that we were going to operate in had to close. Uh, so uh, as time went on, we took the decision that we wanted to go hybrid. Hybrid was the word and the buzzword that was being talked around in the early stages of lockdown and how this was going to be uh, the new way we're moving forward. So how we were going to deliver that was the uh, next stage uh, in that. In order to do that, it was really important that we brought extra expertise onto the uh, onto the group that was going to deliver it. And uh, I'm very pleased to start to introduce those people to you now. Um, so starting, uh, uh, we, as you can see, um, we're doing things slightly different probably than uh, some of the webinars you might have seen before. We've gone hybrid with our delivery of our webinar. So we have a number of us uh, that are actually in the studio, and we also have a number of people that are actually coming in on a Zoom call. So uh, I'll start uh, with introductions. So uh, to my left, uh, Caroline. Hi, I'm Caroline Moran. I'm Managing Director of an events agency called Clear. We're based in Manchester. Uh, we've been established for over 30 years. So I am, our experience is in mostly live events up until March 2020 when things changed for everybody. Um, and now we are very much embedded in the world of virtual hybrid um, and all things in between, um, doing everything digitally. Uh, we've got our own in-house studio, so we build our own content. Um, but we're very focused on keeping things creative, keeping things exciting and making everything we do as engaging as possible. Michael. Hi, I'm Mike from Captive North. Welcome to our Captive Studios. So, uh, yeah, we're a video production company based in Northwestern Trafford Park. And for the last several years, we've been doing a lot of live streaming for events. So we've usually had AV companies coming to us using our expertise. We've been working with Matthew for quite a while in terms of doing live streaming, filming and creating content from him. And then we kind of have the discussion about, well, hey, let's make this hybrid because it's cool. It sounds great. So let's do it. And um, so I got in, got in touch with a couple of our AV companies, start putting our heads together and basically came up with a plan of actually physically how we're going to do it from a technological point of view and make sure it actually works. The rest of the guys actually sorted out all the actual content and shows. I'm, I was mostly running around plugging things in, but you know, someone's got to do it and it was uh, really good. Fantastic. And Becky. Hi, I'm yeah, Becky Gibson. So I have two hats really. Um, my main hat is I run a marketing and PR agency called Tempt. We do strategy, PR, social content creation um, and other digital marketing activities we specialize in hospitality and events um, and then my other hat i'm also director with matthew uh, for unique venues of manchester marvelous and susan would you like to introduce yourself Yep. Hi, it's Susan Brogan from Venue Seekers. We are a boutique venue finding and event management agency based in Buckinghamshire. Um, we've been around for 25 years plus and we organise everything from meetings, conferences, incentives, private dining, awards, dinners, you name it. <clears throat> it was on a live element. Of course, that will change this year. Um, and that's where I knew that I had to get my knowledge and my experience in a different way of running events and uh i met matthew actually through uh the stress matters um organization which you may be aware of uh, we were 
put together as buddies, weren't we, Matthew, back in, I think it was June. Yeah, and absolutely. in our chatting, you asked me if I wanted to be involved in this, and I jumped at the chance because technology is not my expertise. It's not my thing. People are in live events. So this was the perfect opportunity for me to get involved with the team and run a hybrid event from scratch. Brilliant. Thank you. And last but not least, Nathan. Thanks, Matthew. Hi, I'm Nathan Chu. Uh, I work for the Greater Manchester Chamber of Commerce as head of a venue and events. So I manage uh, the Chamber's uh, city centre venue chamber space, uh, which is where this hybrid event took place. And uh, I, I got involved because uh, Matthew and I and Becky uh, joined forces as the Chamber and you need venues to support um, hospitality businesses with networking and information sessions and for some reason Matthew decided that uh, he wanted to work with me on this hybrid conference and I jumped at the chance as it gave me a, a great opportunity to actually experience doing it before we started selling it to our clients which, which, we, which we're now doing so yeah nice to meet you all. Brilliant um, yeah what we've got lined up for you now is a very short video uh, which should give you a little bit of a taste of what it was like uh, on the day of the event. taste of uh, how our event was. Um, the event was on the 1st of October. Um, I think for me the most exciting thing was having uh, a live audience and doing a live event, uh, even though obviously because of the government restricted numbers, uh, we were a maximum of 30 people uh, inside the venue. That included the speakers um, and the uh, crew that were with us. Um, but we were slightly fortunate in the fact that um, you know, one of the reasons uh, why Nathan and I decided you know, to work together, um, because the event was, it's not just a conference, it's a conference and an exhibition. And we needed to find a way of actually hosting that exhibition. Um, and obviously, first priority for us was safety. And I think um, if I pass over to you, Nathan, perhaps you can explain some of the safety measures that you had in place and, and the things that you had to think about in terms of delivering the hybrid event uh, from a safety point of view and from a venue point of view. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. Um, it, was a, it was quite an interesting one. Uh, we, we'd opened far in advance of the event, which, uh, which, which obviously took place on the 1st of October, which was meant to be go day for large live events reopening. And it wasn't, unfortunately. Uh, but we, we'd opened from the uh, beginning of August uh, under the 30-person rule. So we were, we were well prepared in, in some sense. Uh, we had a temperature monitoring camera on the, on the front door. Um, we had lots of lovely, friendly signage, directing people around the venue, sanitising stations, all that sort of stuff. So in one sense, we, as a venue, we felt really prepared. Plus, before this all happened, we, you know, we were well um, we held many, many events with lots and lots of people, so you'd think you'd be ready. But what I will say is we weren't ready quite for a hybrid event, and, and that, that came clear quite quickly once we started planning. I think, as Matthew said, safety was, uh, was the sort of primary uh, concern, but not at the expense of um, the hospitality that we wanted people to experience when they came in. So that was that was a really important factor for me. So in order to achieve that, we, we, we really focused on a couple of things. Uh, the first was our staff. Uh, we had a lot of people on furlough or working sort of part-time. And it was very important to us to make sure that they felt 
very, very comfortable in, in, in the space and dealing with clients. So we went through a process of, of training ready for this event so that when they when they dealt with um, the delegates coming in, it, it was you know a pleasurable experience. They were used to wearing masks and all that sort of stuff. Um, that was really important and it helped them engage with people on the day and, and give people a good experience. Um, we've, done risk, we've all done risk assessments in this uh, sector before. But I don't think I've ever done quite so many, and 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 that uh, and that was a key part of uh, of this process. So you know, a risk assessment for the event, a risk assessment for the venue, a specific COVID risk assessment, and then communicating that to all the uh, all the parties that sort of that joined. Um, cleaning. We we one of the one of the biggest things I noticed about having people in the event on the day was. The perception of safety is almost as important. It's not, but it's almost as important as as the, the safety itself. So, so we employed a new cleaning company uh, and had professional cleaners in the venue on the day. And I, I you know, I don't know. Um, you'll hear from Susan in a minute, but I, I think that may that sort of thing makes all the difference. It's um, it's the sort of perception of what people can see is happening. And, and then what sits underneath it with the risk assessments. Um, we were very lucky to have some uh, pretty great partners working with us. So, so what could be stressful? You think on a hybrid event, I think one of my biggest things was, was, was the time it took to plan. Um, you've only got 25 people in a room that can take 200 people, and yet your planning and the operations on the day are far more intensive than than that 200 person event would be so uh, so i think that was a, that's that's the, the sort of key takeaway for me is spend more time than you think when you when you're approaching a hybrid event uh, don't just think it will be easy because you're going to have less people in the venue uh, and work with you know work with great partners like captive north you know the video the the supplies that come in our caterers at gusto preparing something again that mixture between something that looks good but also is covid secure um but you want people to be tantalized when they're when they're about to eat and i think we achieved that i think we achieved that really well yeah that's that's a definite i think um that that balance between that customer delivery and customer service and the actual uh kind of safety uh was paramount um, obviously, the other the other aspect for me that was reassuring, um, and there's been a, quite a bit of talk about the accreditation side for venues, um, and obviously you had both the MIA accreditation and the Visit Britain We're Good to Go accreditation, which. Again, I think, you know, uh, for any venues out there, it's important to make sure that you've kind of got that reassurance for your event planners and for the delegates attending uh, that, you know, that you are ready and that you do know, like you say, all those risk assessments are complete. And obviously those accreditations need those risk assessments. So uh, I think that's really good. Susan, in terms, you know, obviously you don't just deal with one venue, you're dealing with multiple venues, you're dealing with clients. <laughs> demand for hybrid? Are you starting to see that? Um, how has uh, our event um, kind of seen the, the positive reflection for you in terms of how you're able to deal with your inquiries? Well, I mean, hybrid is an excellent way of bridging the gap until live comes back. To be able to have a live audience and a virtual audience at the same time is uh, the best way forward at the moment while we can't have fully live events. Uh, but I think it takes a completely different mindset and a different planning process because you've effectively got two events running alongside each other. You've got the live audience to think about. And as um, Nathan covered, <clears throat> the whole safety aspect of the venue itself, also the, te also the technology. I don't think Nathan mentioned the te technology and having the right bandwidth and Wi-Fi at the venue has become even more of a priority now when you're running that hybrid element. Plus, for the virtual audience, keeping them engaged, uh, running polls, giving them the ability to ask questions. Um, there is so much more to think about. And as Nathan said, it takes, I didn't realize how much planning or how much longer it takes to plan a hybrid event. But I believe there is definitely a way forward, there is definitely demand. Uh, especially for maybe multiple location hybrid events. So we've got one client looking to do a number of different cities in Europe, uh, all hybrid and then streaming in together. Uh, I don't think it'll ever fully replace live, but I think uh, it's going to be always there and there's always going to be a market for that hybrid event. It's, it's in addition to the portfolio events that we already can do at the moment or have been able to do. Brilliant. Perfect. Thank um, you. 
Right, I'm going to uh, to move on to probably what was one of uh, the most important kind of aspects for us because we've talked about the venue and, and the live audience. Um, uh, we've mentioned the exhibitors, um, but we also had virtual audience and virtual exhibitors as part of our event. Uh, and that needed us to be able to deliver the event through a platform so that that virtual audience could uh, appreciate it and engage with it. Uh, finding the right platform um, was uh, certainly a challenge. And I'll pass over to Michael now, perhaps who you can explain to us, you know, what do you think were the challenges? Um, and, you know, how did we eventually come up with the decision? Yeah, in terms of platforms, there was significantly, there's just so many platforms, if I'm honest. I think I went through about 15 different platforms to try and find the best one. Some had some really nice features with the polling, the Q&A. Others had the integrated ticketing system so that people could actually register directly on the platform. Where others had the different sessions and the way they actually laid it out. I mean, you have some that you can book it on, others that have it in a massive timeline and you have to select the different ones. And it was trying to find the right platform that had all the different aspects. So it had for us a way that we can get people on we can get them to connect with each other. We can get them to talk and connect and discuss and book meetings because we actually had physical exhibitors there that needed to actually book meetings with and actually have uh, messaging and conversations with, as well as the seminars, which had the Q&As, the polls, so that the virtual audience could also interact with the actual seminar. So it's not just a one-way stream because that's really quite important. I mean. Over in America, they define it as omni-channel, which I think is a bit ridiculous personally. But um, is one of those things is when you're doing an event like this, it's not just about, oh, I'm just going to stream it. That's very one-directional. You've got this massive virtual audience. You've got to connect with it. So you've got to have the right platform that allows you to connect to that virtual audience. And then the final consideration across all of this was cost. There are some fantastic platforms out there and swap cards are a really great one because it does price per exhibitor that books on so you can create limits and create numbers and actually get an idea of the costs. There are others where you can buy a subscription and if you've got 40 events then that is the most cost effective method but it's trying to find the right balance for everything that we were going on was um, yeah it was really quite interesting. Yeah, I think I, I think it was possibly one of the biggest challenges um, kind of finding the platform, and 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 Swapcard did work for us. So I think the other aspect for me that um, when looking at the platform again is this coming back to having live audience, live exhibitors, virtual audience, virtual exhibitors, uh, and and in fact also live speakers and virtual speakers, Caroline, didn't we, uh, in terms of the content. And and the platform swap card actually ended up being exactly the right one because of the interaction that it enabled for the virtual audience and the live audience uh, using the platform. So yeah, for me, it, whilst it was painful going through the process and, you know, I, I think for, you know, my recommendation is, you know, there are lots of platforms out there. I think over time, I think, we're going to see platforms develop so that what one has, the other one will pick up and they'll become a much more blended uh, kind of one-stop shop type of approach for, for platforms so that they're more accessible to everybody. Um, you know, the integration, as we talked about with Eventbrite, uh, which was our registration plat uh, aspect, um, was seamless, which was fantastic for us as well. Um, but then it was about loading that content onto uh, onto the platform, and and also first off before even loading it on there, actually coming up with what the content was. <laughs> Caroline, um, if I kind of pass to you in terms of what do you see as the the were our challenges in terms of the platform? Uh, sorry, uh, the content, um, and you know again probably talk about what you got out of the event because obviously as I kind of alluded to, uh, unfortunately you were going to be a live host for one of the panel sessions, but ended up being a virtual host. Maybe just talk about yeah, what that I was mean, like. I was involved a little bit when I think I sat on a couple of calls with, with Michael and we sort of went through the platforms and I found it really hugely interesting and how different it was. And I think probably my key takeaway from choosing a platform is 
you do need to invest time up front to get the right one and you do need to really start with planning what your event is before you start looking at the platform otherwise you're just going to go around in circles and you need to really scope out what we're trying to achieve how are we trying to do it what do we want our audience to think feel and do while the event is going on and that will drive the decision making as well as like Mike says the cost because it is quite varied in the cost um, as, as Matthew said I unfortunately couldn't make it on the day so I had to stream in and um, you know Covid made me stay at home and miss out um, so I had to stay at home and get streamed in um, and the, so I was watching the whole event through the platform and I thought it was brilliant I thought it was a really good platform there was lots going on um, I think it's made me think about my audience better and understand my audience better when I'm planning events now in the fact that <laughs> nobody just sits watching they want something to do so give them something to do don't think of it as a they're not going to be listening to the messaging they're not going to be distracted they're not going to be paying attention because they're not they are actually going to be engaging with it because if you don't give them something to do content wise with polls questions q a what do you think send us your pictures or whatever it might be you do they're going to get distracted elsewhere uh, they're going to drift onto social media they're going to drift onto this so give them things to do don't be scared about giving them things to do um, because I think it really adds to the event. Uh, the other big takeaway from being an at-home viewer was I had a massive fear of missing out. <laughs> uh, absolutely sat at home just wishing I was there. Um, I don't know whether that's because I haven't been at a live event since March or what, but I think that is a really key thing about doing a hybrid event that you you can't you can't recreate getting 200 people in a room you just can't and there's nothing that's going to replace that but this really will help me put give people that drive to want to come to your event next year so if you're flirting with the idea of doing it i would say go for it because i think it will really push what you what you do next year <laughs> Yeah, I oh, absolutely agree. And I, I'm actually going to quote one of our speakers, which was uh, Juliet Tripp. And she said, uh, if content is king, delivery is is queen. Um, so the, the delivery and the platform and, and, and uh, the content is absolutely kind of uh, to vital. And, and to coin your phrase, <laughs> we don't all just watch TV anymore. You know, we're all doing something rather than just literally watching tele. For me, it's the ironing. Um, but um, <laughs> I think for most people, it's probably being on their phone. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it's so that's has to translate into delivering events. You know, you've got to make sure that that um, audience, um, all audiences are engaged um, because they can easily uh, switch off. Um, in terms of our overall content, we, we kind of took a bit of a traditional approach, didn't we, in terms of the content? We went down the line of having a welcome presentation. Uh, we had uh, the incredible Martin Fullard, obviously from Mash Media, doing our keynote speech. And then we had kind of the panel sessions. And then, it, and because of that in, in kind of fear of making sure that there was engagement for the virtual audience continuously, we added then in some what we classed was engagement sessions, um, but extra sessions. And I suppose I think our learning from that was. Also, don't be afraid to don't overload um, content and that, uh, you know, there is is chance if you're doing, you know, we did a full day event. Uh, so there is chance for a virtual audience to take a break as well as uh, the live audience. So, uh, so again, that's probably a learning in terms of the content planning um, of the day, which I kind of uh, took out of it. Um, Anything else, Michael, you can think from a production point of view? You know, obviously, uh, you being the, the kind of production man in terms of, you know, all I know is that there were cameras in the room. You said we were streaming it to YouTube and then on YouTube it went into the platform. But maybe uh, without kind of blinding us with uh, technical science, was there anything else that... No, that's pretty much it. Okay. <laughs> no, no, yeah. Yeah, so we had, we had each room had its own full PA system set up for the actual audience there. But then we also had to do a separate mix that is what we actually sent out that was streamed out because that you know the needs of the room is different to the needs of the audience at home because they haven't got big professional speakers they haven't got to think about room dynamics we need to address it slightly there we also had as Carolyn mentioned people who couldn't actually attend so the actual rooms itself that we're in we had to think very carefully about the size of the room the number of people we could get in I mean we've got dividers in right now to help us actually sit closer together but not breach social distancing because we're actually adding in additional protection to allow us to get closer together otherwise you could end up with a seven foot stage and it's like well that's 
for some venues, that's not going to be possible. Um, and then we have the virtual audience and the virtual hosts. So Carolyn, unfortunately, a couple of days before, and was like, I'm not going to be able to make it. We were like, OK, she's hosting one of the actual sessions. How is this going to work? So we, we knew we were going to have a couple of panelists who weren't going to be able to join us. So we had Zoom set up. And it's kind of like what we've got set up right now. So we've got three of us here, but three of us at home. We'll actually be able to set up a way that we can have people joining us remotely <laughs> running questions being part of the show so you know we've got susan nathan and becky there they can actually interact they can hear everything we're saying we can hear everything they're saying we can have a nice big conversation all of that is then what's streamed out to you guys that you're also hearing it hearing it on the zoom webinar and it's trying to tie everything all together which you know it's it was a bit complicated i think the one big thing that i'm going to take away from it was actually when it comes back to the q a which i know we're running q a in this if you guys have got any questions please make sure you're sending it through it's thinking about that because me asking you send your questions in now takes into account any delay from us actually saying it in the studio to you then hearing it at home so that we get the questions back on time another part of it was how do we manage questions when you got people from at home watching it virtually and people in the studio and i don't think we actually got that quite right on the day mm -hmm. something we need to actually look into because on the day we couldn't actually take questions from the room traditionally with like a catch box microphone because that's not covid safe so it's trying to point everybody to one location which you know admittedly was perhaps not the right idea maybe something we need to adjust next time but it's you know it's definitely lots of things to consider we've definitely learned a lot and been able to achieve like right now we're doing a hybrid in our little studio which is <laughs> I'm quite happy, quite chuffed. <laughs> Brilliant, yeah. Um, yeah, I think from my point of view, uh, having expertise in production um, and audiovisual, again, for me, is is a vital lesson. Um, without you guys, you know, we would have never been able to deliver it. Um, and certainly, um, uh, we, <laughs> I would have hated to thought what it would have looked like um, uh, if we'd done it that way. Um, so, you know, throughout this process, uh, we had got the platform, we got the content, we approached speakers. We we're very lucky to get some uh, incredible speakers, uh, both international and national. Um, to, to speak as panellists and, 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 and guest present, presenters. Um, we had the venue, we had our exhibitors, so we'd recruited the uh, exhibitors to come along. Um, interesting for me on the exhibitors was uh, we literally had 50% live and 50% virtual. Um, we used the individual private meeting rooms within the chamber space for each individual live exhibitor, meaning that that was a separate meeting room and we could manage the safety on that side of things. Um, and a real mixed response from those exhibitors in terms of uh, <laughs> The live exhibitors, uh, some saying, oh, it's so incredible being at a live event. It's, you know, this is the best thing um, since lockdown. Uh, and others going, actually, I think I might try virtual next time. Um, and similarly, on the virtual side saying, oh, uh, as you alluded to, Caroline, oh, really feel like I missed out not being there live. Um, and, and again, some other virtual exhibitors saying, this is fantastic. I, I engaged with so many more people um, through the platform than I would ever have done at a live event. So, you know, there's a real mix on, on, on the exhibition side. So um, that was uh, uh, really interesting. So, so we had the venue, we've got our exhibitors, we've got the content, we've got the platform, we're ready to go. Um, now we just needed some actual attendees and this is where I'm going to uh, pass over to Becky and say, you know, obviously the, we kind of done it the wrong way around because we kind of started with marketing communication really should be the first uh, port. But, um, you know, do you want to explain, Becky, kind of what we did in terms of uh, attracting the audience um, and also kind of, you know, what going from what we've historically done and deliver a live event to delivering a hybrid event from a marketing communication point of view, what was the impact from your perspective? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think a lot of things were the same. So, um, you know, we've done this. This is the third time that we've run the expo, marketed the expo. So we know our audience. We know, you know, how to engage our audience, what channels to use. Um, I guess what was different uh, mainly was the ever changing scenario that we're in um, and the fact that, you know, regulations and government news changing so we had to be very reactive to that um, and through that process like like you just said it wasn't a kind of tick checklist it was it was that we all all of us every part was quite interconnected 
so you know we have we had um a plan and we put content out in phased kind of methods but that was due to us all you know bringing in content ideas partners exhibitors um, and putting those all together and I think a key process or part of the messaging that was different was explaining what our objectives were and the openness that we had to you know portray in terms of this was the first time you put a hybrid event this is a showcase to the industry um, so yeah that's I think how it was different as a hybrid Cool. And um, obviously, in terms of how we communicated, you know, um, uh, previously, we'd kind of used more traditional methods, I suppose, of advertising in industry press, etc. And then obviously, we continued the process in terms of doing press announce, but we went a bit more social, didn't we? Yeah, well, obviously, yeah, social was a key part of it. Um, on various different channels, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, yeah, and we, you know, we did, we spent on on social ads, which yeah was really successful, and you know we did a lot of PR as well. So we had a lot of you know press coverage, um, and we had backing from media, which was you know really important. So like obviously with Martin Fullard, Conference News covered it, um, and various other different publications, which was yeah really important to drive to drive people to get people engaged, and then obviously attendees to sign up. Yeah. Okay, just to give you an idea of the numbers that we had at the event, uh, we were a total of 320, uh, of which uh, obviously we actually had 23 live attendees um, and then speakers and exhibitors uh, on top, plus then the rest, uh, which was around I believe, 272 um, off memory uh, virtual attendees. So um, for us, that was about a 250% growth on the number of attendees we normally get. Obviously, our event is normally quite localized to Manchester. So, um, you know, obviously, again, one of the big uh, benefits of delivering a hybrid event and having a virtual audience is you can go much more global uh, in terms of your reach uh, and obviously larger numbers in terms of your attendance. So um, I think that's all we've got in terms of passing on information to you. I can see there's a number of questions that come in, so I'll kind of start to try and answer those and then we'll perhaps wrap with kind of the big takeaways that we, we took from the event. Um, I can see how do you cost a hybrid event for exhibitors? Um, <laughs> Because we were delivering a showcase event, uh, it wasn't about uh, profitability on this particular one. We were trying to showcase for the industry uh, to try and really kind of kickstart. So actually costs are quite difficult to to uh, identify. Um, what I would say is that the platform charged you for every um, uh, exhibitor um, and therefore we had a cost price so obviously we knew that we had to go above that in order to uh, to, to deliver a price uh, for the exhibitors. Um, in terms of ticket pricing we were a free event for the industry so again uh, setting ticket price uh, was uh, not uh, at this event so um, I suppose from a from a point of view you kind of need to look at what your overheads are and what your objectives are you know as we had a very clear objectives of what we wanted to achieve from our event so that's the starting block for any event really um, so understanding what you want out of it would probably dictate your ticket price and what you per your perceived value that you think you can get on that um, did you have a live exhibitor and virtual exhibitors part of the event uh, yes I think hopefully I covered that a little bit and how did the virtual audience engage with the live exhibitors um, through the platform so all of the engagement was done was through the platform uh, to um, so whether you were live or virtual um, you could interact with the exhibitors so um, obviously if you were live you know uh, attendee you could go into each of the individual meeting rooms with a pre-booked appointment which was made on the platform or there was a live um, zoom link uh, for live chat um, between um, a live attendee and a virtual uh, exhibitor or vice versa so hopefully that's uh, answered that one um, and, and that was true of uh, attendees connecting with each other uh, live and virtual attendees could interact with each other and connect with each other again through the platform. Um, so that was very good. Um, how do you judge the success of the hybrid exhibition? How many have rebooked and uh, real virtual? Um, well, as I mentioned, we were a 50 50 split in terms of the live and virtual exhibitors. Uh, we charged the same price uh, on that side of things. Um, uh, so 
yeah, it kind of, uh, I think it, in terms of our success, um, all of our exhibitors said that they would book for next year. So we had a 100% uh, positive feedback uh, from the questionnaire that we sent out to our exhibitors post event. So um, that was really positive on that. Uh, did you do any physical badging at the live part? How did you keep them hands off? Uh, how is this practical with a thousand visitors where we can? Um, in terms of live badging, uh, we didn't, but we still had an entry into the venue. Nathan, do you want to perhaps answer how we managed that a little bit more? I suppose in terms of kind of keeping them hands off, uh, we, well, you can go into the fact that obviously people were still wearing face masks. We still had social distancing markers and signage in, in the venue. When it comes to a thousand people, you're obviously going to need a much larger space to do that. But I don't know if you can add anything. Yeah, I don't. Um, I think in terms of badges, I, I guess the the question is really how do people know who other people are when they're when they're in the venue, and that wasn't something that that, that we that we tackled on the day. I mean, we did, we definitely didn't put our hands on anyone on the day, which I'm pretty sure we didn't. Anyway, I didn't see anyone uh, anyone anyone touching anyone else. But um, uh, yeah, so I, I mean, we had a we had a track and trace upon entry. And what we what we've got installed now, which we didn't have on the day, uh, which is due to come on stream, is is actual facial recognition which you can submit your photograph before the event and that that is one way of potentially you know if you can integrate that with one of these solutions that could be that could be a, a, a solution to um, make sure people know who other people are as they as they walk around the venue but there were, there were no badges no badges on site yeah. Yeah, no, and, and I suppose the because the interaction, whether you're live or virtual, will still through the platform. Uh, I can see there's a question about what the platform was. So the name of the platform is called Swap Card uh, that we used. As we've mentioned, there's uh, alternative um, uh, others available from a BBC point of view, not just one. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, the interaction. Um, uh, on the actual platform itself, you create a mini profile for yourself on the platform once you're registered and got into the actual uh, platform for the actual event. Uh, and then, you know, that's another way you can add photo, you can add a bio of yourself. And then when you connect with someone else, they can see more detail about yourself and connect with you through that way. So again, that platform it was really important, wasn't it, for us? Um, it was, yeah. For engagement, you know, that's that was the key aspect of what we wanted to do. So, um, I think just looking at the time wise, um, let's see if we've got any other questions in there. Um, did you change virtual and live exhibitors the same? Yes, Charge. hopefully I've covered that one. Yes. Um, any tips for exhibitors in getting effective delegate interaction um, at a hybrid event? Um, I would say uh, speak to uh, Kimpton Clock Tower, who managed uh, to exceed uh, everyone's expectations in terms of interacting with the attendees. Um, <laughs> Again, the platform and events, it's not just about the day anymore. You know, we've got to think that event, uh, a hybrid event or a virtual event, yes, the hybrid aspect and the live audience are there on the day, but there's aspects to having a platform that you do before event. We talked about this, about the before, um, that you could add content that people could, when they come onto the platform two, three days before or a week before, um, and start watching content about the forthcoming day of your event. And then the longevity of it, you know, it, it's now, you know, if anyone would like to see the event, they can email me and I'll give them a code to get on and see what we did on the day. So it's, you know, you've now got this historical uh, information available for to share with people. Um, so there's longevity to it. So if someone didn't attend and missed out and want you want that person to still see it, it's catch up TV. You know, we, we're in that mode now that you have that ability to be able to do that. Um, so I think uh, it's very, uh, does that answer that question? I think I've gone off so. a little bit on that. Um, yeah. Um, do you think this concept would be transferable and useful for a wedding open, a wedding open house? Um, I think 
Uh, I would say yes, because, you know, the one thing I'd say about our industry, we are probably uh, the most creative bunch of people that I know. And if there's a way of doing something, we'll find it and we'll deliver it and we'll deliver it to the best of our ability. Um, anyone disagree with that one? Uh, uh, let me know. But uh, I think, you know, our learning would, I would say, we've managed to deliver something that I never thought we'd be able to deliver. Um, and I'm very proud and thankful to everyone uh, that spoken here today for helping to deliver it. But um, yeah, I think you can actually put, if you put your mind to it, you can deliver any event in this way. Um, and certainly, you know, there's experts here that can do it a lot better than uh, what I can. But uh, I <laughs> oh, think, you, you think um, yourself, Matthew. Yeah, you're doing yeah. Great. Um, but looking at the time, I'm conscious of time. Um, I think it's a final lesson that you would say, your final kind of uh, takeaway for the audience at home. Uh, Caroline? Yeah, I'm going to give two. That's Ooh, right. Yeah, give two. So I'm just going to repeat a little bit what you've said about content is you have got an opportunity to create a real legacy with your content, that it can be much more than just one day. It can You can really extend the shelf life of your event uh, way beyond. So think about that when you're doing your content as well of what can you use, how can you use it, how can you get the most out of it rather than just where we do you know, unfortunately with events, we are quite a bit of a one day only in a lot of ways. You know, you do it one day and it's never used again. So, you know, you're thinking differently anyway. So think differently about your content. Um, and secondly, get the right resource in. Um, you know, I don't mind admitting I've been doing events for 16 years and it is like learning a whole new job. And it's OK to say it's like learning a whole new job because it is. So, you know, don't be shy to go to experts and ask for that help and to say to them, like Michael right here, we don't know what we're doing. We know how to do a live event, but how do we do this? How do we do that? Get the help you need to deliver it because you are going to invest in it. It is an investment of time and money. Do it right. And don't be afraid to admit, I don't know what I'm doing because it is all new. So, But there's experts out there that there can is, help. Yeah, there is. And yeah. they're getting cleverer and cleverer yeah. by the hour, aren't they, Michael? Try your best. <laughs> Michael, for you, what's your takeaway lesson uh, that you can pass to our audience? Yeah, uh, take your time, learn the platform, learn what works, what doesn't work, and the pitfalls. Um, from a production side, the difficulty we had was actually something I never thought would occur, was actually getting enough crew on site. Be having to have crew that suddenly come to me and go, I'm sorry, someone in my household's got symptoms. I've got to self-isolate. I can't shout at them because that's not their fault. But from my side, it's going, okay, I'm now down a crew, so I've now got to get more crew. So it's, you always have to have a backup for your production crew to make sure you've got someone to take over if someone can't attend or can't, um, or are self-isolating. And then, yeah, it's the platform, learning what works, what doesn't work. We managed to get the Zoom working with you, taking host, which I didn't think would work so well. And it, it really did, having you middle screen and suddenly, <laughs> here we go, Carolyn's taking the message, off we go, great. Um, and learning, learning about the delays and how to deal with that virtual audience. So for everything that we were doing in the room was 20 seconds delay before it hit the virtual audience at home. So it's then trying to modify the show to making sure that people are aware of this delay and actually be able to work with this delay. Brilliant. And Becky, your big takeaway. Um, my big takeaway, I guess, is as well as kind of having great content, but the value of the partnership, not necessarily all the organisers, but all the stakeholders. So, you know, your speakers, your exhibitors and engaging absolutely everyone um, to help tell the story, I guess. Brilliant. Yeah, you know, I definitely agree with that one. It's uh, and kind of that realisation for me is, is that you kind of need the double, double up the team almost. Um, I know someone's asked a question about the cost of a hybrid event. Um, yeah, you are kind of doubling up a little bit. Um, there's areas that you can save money on in terms of like catering, for example, um, compared to room hire. So uh, sorry, venues, but you know, that's, I think that's going to be something that we're going to have to get used to. Um, but uh, yeah, completely agree. Uh, Susan, what about you? What your takeaway? Well, I hadn't even heard of the word hybrid, I think, before this year. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I could not have done this alone. It's not something you can do on your own. You need a trusted 
group of partners, a very good production company. Michael, you did amazing. Um, and I think don't, un, don't underestimate how much planning is required in advance. It takes a lot more planning than a live event. And also... Uh, you need to plan the event and um, what you want to achieve from that event before choosing the platform as opposed to choosing the platform and try to fit that into your event. It's very important to have it all planned out in advance and then choose the right platform that fits that. Yeah, again, I, again, I'd agree. And, and where we got to the conclusion to use SwapCard uh, was around what it could do um, or it would achieve our objectives rather than what it could do. Uh, Nathan. Final yeah, I think like quite you. quite simply, it's the never forget the live is is the part of this event that is going to is going to make the rest of it exciting as well. So do everything you can to make that live part as pleasurable as impressive as possible because that really and I think everyone who did organise this event could see that the live part made the hybrid part of it exciting because there are people in the room really enjoying that physical experience. So never forget how important that is. Brilliant. Uh, um, hopefully that's um, kind of given you uh, a bit of insight to what we did in terms of our event, uh, what we learned from our event, and uh, hopefully enable you to um, put on your own hybrid events um, and give you a bit more confidence uh, in able to do it. Obviously, you know, we are happy to uh, uh, kind of provide support um, and you can obviously get in touch with us um, if you need to um, or would like to, uh, and we can certainly help. Um, my email address is matthew at uniquevenuesofgreatbritain.co.uk. Um, and uh, like I say, if you wanted to see the um, event um, or uh, want to get in touch with any questions uh, or need some support, then obviously just drop me a line on that site. So I think that's uh, everything from us. Um, obviously, uh, thank you to International Complex for allowing us to partake in this uh, webinar. Um, obviously, this is a series, so don't forget uh, this will be occurring uh, next Thursday as well. Uh, so look out for uh, what's coming up next. Um, and uh, other than that, thank you all for listening. And and um, I wish you all well. Stay safe.